about it. Yeah, it's going to look cool. Welcome, everyone, to our first Patreon interview of June 2022. With us today is Professor Helen Davies of the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, our sister campus. A lot of debate about which campus is prettier. I don't know which one uh, I would pick. Maybe Colorado Springs? <laughs> I mean, Boulder is pretty, pretty cool. We just have a very good view from afar. Yeah, well, I mean, it's an awesome view. Garden of it's the Gods with Pikes Peak in the background from campus. It's, <laughs> it's truly hard to argue with, actually. Yeah, I mean, how bad can your day be when you can look at that? Um, so tell us a little bit about what you work on, uh, maybe a little bit about a current project that you're doing right now. Yeah, cool. OK, so hi, everyone. It's lovely to meet you all. Um, I am an assistant professor of the Digital Humanities in the English Department at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs, as was just mentioned. And what that means is that I work on a weird variety of stuff. I work on um, this field called the Digital Humanities, which is using computer-assisted technologies to try to work with text in new ways. Um, I'm a medievalist, so my particular interest is um, my particular interest is using uh, computer assisted technologies to work with medieval texts and particularly medieval manuscripts. I happen to work with this technology extensively called multispectral imaging, which is where I use fancy cameras and uh, specific bands of light to recover texts that are no longer visible to the naked eye. I my own particular area of interest um, varies back and forth between largely medieval maps but also medieval literature um, kind of as a whole. Uh, Stella, thank you for putting those websites in the chat. You distracted me because I have to give a kind of slight warning, a slight caveat that the um, digital scholar one, the Rochester one was one that I put together my final year of PhD school. So it's slightly out of date and I have apologies for that. The academia.edu has more up-to-date things on it, but, um, but the, Rochester one is prettier. So thank you for putting both of those in the chat. That's very sweet of you. Um, yeah, so I work, I use uh, computer assisted technologies to work on medieval manuscripts. I work a lot on medieval world maps, which are called medieval mapamundi, but I also um, teach early medieval literature. One of my graduate students, Gavin, is in this chat right now. I see. Uh, hi, Gavin. Hi, Gavin. And uh, Gavin and I work on uh, work on Old English. We did a teeny tiny bit of Old Norse. Uh, we have worked on a variety of different early medieval languages. One of my other graduate students uh, is a Latinist, and so we may start doing some more of that kind of work in the future. So a wide variety of things. They tend to be connected by a theme of using medieval, or sorry, computer technologies to work with medieval texts but that looks different as we talk about literature, as we talk about languages, as we talk about the material object and how we kind of can study that. And could you, if uh, I can let you share screen, I think we're maybe both co-hosts. I'll make you co-host if you're not. Could, could you possibly show us one of these Mapamundis so that we can kind of oh, get a sense of what you're, what you're talking about? For sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, let me see here. Um, you, you, I think you're co-host now and you should be able to share screen. Um, cool, thank you. Um, I had some images pulled up and let me just, actually, I don't think I had any of the maps pulled up. So I'm just gonna try and find you one real quick. Um, okay, so this is not actually the one that I will happily refer to as my baby, which you know is not at all possessive of medieval manuscripts. Um, so the the most recent project that I've been working on um, extensively with Dr. Heather Wacka out of the University of, Was of, of Wisconsin-Madison is trying to recover the Tournai maps. And so these are not Mapamundi, but these are medieval maps. Uh, these are housed at the British Library. I'm not sure if you can see um, in this kind of PowerPoint image, but there is what we call an undertext here. These are palimpsests. So somebody wrote out these, drew out these maps, and then the cartographer dude went, no, actually, I'm good. I screwed up. I'm going to redo this. And he scratched out all of his work and then drew the whole thing over again. 
However, we think that the underneath text, if you can kind of see it here at the top, and if you can kind of see it here at the bottom, we think it's a radically different map. Um, and I have some slightly controversial theories about what's going on here that I definitely cannot publish because I have very limited evidence for this, but I think I'm right, which is for me the important thing, um, is <laughs> right, absolutely going on here. And so um, I'm using these camera systems to try and recover some of these texts. And so here are some of my draft versions. And so you can kind of see that the white text here is the over text. And you can kind of see that the black text, the black um, drawings and images is the stuff that was erased. Just, oh. I'm not quite happy with the results yet, but it's getting there. And here you can see it in a different shade of what can only be described as neon purple. Um, and so here is my latest artistic rendition, which definitely comes with the highly scientific tools of colored pencils. And here you can see um, separating out the layers of undertext and to try and recover a lost medieval map that hasn't been seen in um, 800 years. So that's the kind of thing I'm pretty excited about right now. So is it a map of a different place entirely underneath, you think? Yeah, so actually, I think it's really cool. I think um, I think one of them was a larger regional map of the Middle East um, that has been really focused in on the version that survives. But the the original version would have been quite large. So basically, you know how like if you have Google Maps on your phone, right? And you're like, cool, I'm currently in London, everybody, I'm teaching in London right now. So I might, if I pull up Google Maps on my phone, if I'm trying to show my students something, it might be like, here's London. And then I kind of want to show them specifically the region of London we're in. So I zoom in a little bit. And then I want to make sure that they can all individually find Paddington Station. So then I zoom in real far. And that's kind of what we had going on, I think, originally, was we had a kind of writ large one and then a zoomed in version. And then we kind of got an even more zoomed in version in the second layer. And, so, and a map of something completely different. And so the best that we can assume is that this guy came across some type of new information and we're not quite sure what his original logic was. And this is still an ongoing project. We're trying to finalize our initial findings in the next month or so. Um, but that's the images I had closest to hand. And then I can see if I can find for you real quick. What would be the uh, purpose of a map like that? Is that for pilgrims or? What a good question you ask. Um, so, so a map like that um, would have basically housed information, if that makes sense. Um, so if you think, if you think about, if you think about how you try and organize information for yourself, right? So um, I don't know about you, but when I was in coursework, I was I would make elaborate charts or diagrams to myself to kind of keep information straight, right? And a lot of these maps functioned as kind of elaborate diagrams. Um, they would be sort of a visual encyclopedia where they would store information over here and they would help kind of um, perhaps provide some kind of context for a reader, but they wouldn't necessarily provide, um, they wouldn't necessarily tell you how to get from point A to point B, right? Let's see, okay, okay. So it's but more they of might a say, reference than a guide, yeah. okay. Yeah, have you seen those um, very cheesy maps, which are kind of cute, um, of the front range cities that look like Tolkien maps? Yeah. Yeah, so they're not gonna tell you how to get from, the, the springs to boulder but they're okay, going to give right. you relative distances i also note that those are seldom made by people who seem to know colorado firsthand so maybe yeah. actually that's another uh, yeah. commonality there mm -hmm. i would say that that is a distinct commonality here huh. um okay definitely working with secondhand information right but also more for giving someone context maybe illuminating something about like where an event in some chronicle or, or saint's life or whatever happened then yeah. or like how to get from Constantinople to Tyre or something. Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. So my favorite world map that I work on is the Vercelli Mapamundi. And it tells you uh, things like 
where Jason and Ar the Argonauts went to steal the Golden Fleece. And it also tells you where you can find the bodies of several apostles. Is it going to tell you how to get to those places? Probably not. That's fun. Okay, I see. Um, Lorianna also asks, what type of material are these maps drawn on and would they reuse them because of the cost of the materials? That's a great question. That's a wonderful question. Thank you so much. Um, so these maps are drawn on the same kind of thing that all medieval texts would have been drawn on. <laughs> Sorry, that's way too broad of a generalization that a large amount of um, medieval text would have been written on. So they were written on parchment mostly, um, and they would reuse them because of the cost. So if you, um, so I think somebody did the calculations at one point that an average Bible would have been made up of 60 sheep, which I am now strongly pro measuring books by the number of sheep. Um, this is my new favorite unit of measurement, uh, but <laughs> I mean, yeah, but, <laughs> yeah. Let's just keep this going into 2022. Like, you know, you know <laughs> I wrote a I wrote a four sheeper. You know, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to th trying to think of what one of my books would be in proportion to the Bible. Yeah, maybe like a four sheeper. Although with your most. Although with the Bible, I mean, also there's a long standing practice of cramming as much onto one page as you can. Although that's also true of a lot of medieval manuscripts. Yeah. So. I'm going to go on Amazon and review your latest translation as it's a good four sheeper and provide no <laughs> further context. Um, it'll be I mean, great. It's, it's as helpful as a lot of Amazon reviews. <laughs> And actually, and, and of course, and of course, the the concluding thing is like one star because like it didn't arrive on time or something. Or you call, yes. this, you call this Christmas gift wrap? Yeah, because you were single handedly responsible for Amazon postal delivery. And and Stella also points out: tell people that you don't include the old Norse text to save sheep. Yeah, and that's there. You go, <laughs> Stella. I like the idea of doing that. And again, still not providing any context about how it's saving <laughs> sheep. <laughs> it's like, just let people wonder. Uh, and actually, this is maybe an overbroad question, although it's something that, that I was curious about because I couldn't quite tell looking at that map. Uh, what languages do we find maps in? Are they in Latin? Are they in the vernacular? What are we, what are we looking at that way? What a wonderful question. Um, so they are largely in Latin. Um, though there is a truly brilliant, um, there's a truly brilliant book by Nicholas Howe on Old English maps. And he argues that Old English maps were written out. So they weren't, they weren't drawn. It's the kind of notion that like, so, okay. So I grew up in the Midwest in kind of small town Ohio. And it was fairly common for people where I grew up to kind of give directions. Like you go 15 minutes down the road. Mm. And like, if you get to the stoplight with the ice cream store next to it, you turn left. And so it's that kind of verbal map that we see a lot. 15 minutes down the road, see the big creek, turn right at the red barn. If you've gone past the bridge, you've, you've gone too far and turn back. And um, this kind of notion that we are presupposed um, I'm not sure if that's the word I was looking for, but we are kind of, we assume that maps are visual and they weren't necessarily. And so you get uh, vernacular maps, but the maps themselves may look wildly different. But that also, I mean, for a place that you know well, you might not actually have much of a mental map of, it might be more like, oh, I just remember that I turn at this spot. Yeah. Or, uh, I mean, I've had that come up a little bit with places that I'm kind of, like not a familiar with and not f familiar with but like bc familiar with it's yeah. like I actually, you know what i mean like i actually see a physical map it's like oh i didn't even think about the fact that this crosses this that this is the same road as this because i'm so used to turning this way or that way you know what i mean yeah like actually, yeah yeah, it, yeah it actually strikes me as being very much the way that people do familiarize themselves because I, I don't know that that many people make mental like we talk about somebody having a mental map but i don't know how often that's actually somebody has like a mental like cartographic representation of a place it's more like a sense of where to turn right exactly i think that's pretty real and i think that one of the reasons that medieval maps look so wonky to us is that it's like somebody has taken that mental map out of their brain and put it on yeah. a paper or on a piece of parchment 
and that parchment is what survives. And so we're looking at it and we're going, bro, what? But yeah. it's actually, it makes sense if you have the kind of context for it and the sort of information that is trying to be stored on that. Uh -huh. And maybe if you think about it more at ground level than at the air level of our maps. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, because this is one of the things that is like universally true, but is like a weird thing to think about is that aerial views didn't exist, right? right. Like planes sure. quite obviously didn't exist. But we are so used to thinking of maps as this like satellite vision of the world around us. And that fundamentally didn't exist. And so even, even if you go back before Google Maps to like a random McNally atlas, right? If I'm thinking about road trips as a kid, then they're still kind of laid out with this like aerial view in mind, right? But like that's not necessarily, there's nothing that requires maps to follow that. It's just that we have kind of become used to this sort of notion. Yeah, that's a really helpful thing to keep in mind. Uh, by the way, Cameron asks, uh, what about pens and inks used by scribes at the time? What do we know about those? Yeah, so that's a great question as well. Thank you for that. Um, so <laughs> pens do tend to be as stereotypical as this is, well, okay? So um, they do tend to be, uh, kind of, yeah, they do tend to be sharpened writing implements and they do tend to be quills. Uh, inks vary quite a bit. So we get iron gall ink, which I think Gavin mentioned in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, then there are also things like, um, there's a word that I can never pronounce correctly, the Theophilus ink, which is like a largely plant-based ink. And um, a lot, apparently, a lot of early materials in the British Isles, at least, were of this type of ink. Um, I don't know what Old Norse texts tend to be written in. I wouldn't be surprised if it was iron gall ink because that became very, very widespread as time went on, but I don't know that for sure. I believe the really that's cool what thing I've heard. Sorry? I believe that's what I've heard. I'm not a big yeah. manuscript physicality person, but maybe I need to read more into this. I mean, I'm obsessed, but not everybody yeah. needs to be obsessed. Um, and so, but the cool thing about iron gall ink is that if you take a photograph at, of iron gall ink at 940 nanometers, right? So in the very, very near IR, uh, it disappears. It just <laughs> like, what for whatever reason, it just like vanishes. So you can test for it by only using light, which doesn't then damage the manuscript at all which is kind of cool um, because otherwise to test what chemical composition an, an ink is made of, it requires a bit more, um, it can require a bit more destructive techniques. And if you tell a curator of a manuscript that like, you just have a question, so you're just gonna destroy a little bit of this ma medieval manuscript to try and answer it, they're not gonna, they're not gonna react well. Right. Right. <laughs> Well, and a lot of these manuscripts are under lock and key, and even more so than they used to be, uh, yeah. is my experience. In fact, um, I'm going to be in Iceland in late August, and I am in the application process for getting access to the Codex Regis, the Poetic Edda. That's right? so cool. But it's like it's an application now, right? Um, I can remember 15 years ago, I was there, and it was on display at a, in a museum. Not anymore. It's under lock and key, and you have to like really justify that you want to look at it. Um, so I'm not totally sure that I'll be able to. <laughs> um, but it looks like I'll get to uh, look at a prose and a manuscript uh, at least. But uh, what a get it's so very, very hard to get. Yeah, yeah. They, I don't know. Some some institutions, if they've digitized it, then use that as an excuse to not let you get hands on access to it. Yeah. But I'm a big proponent that there are many, many things you can only learn from having a hands-on access to the manuscript itself. Well, and as a manuscript person, you, you tell me if this sounds like a legitimate purpose. I'd like to make a video with the physical manuscript and be able to show people who, who won't have that access. Like this is, you know, like give a sense of its, of its physicality. This is its size. This is, uh, you know, this is this is the experience of being around this actual manuscript. Look, it's not written in runes. Uh, here, you know, here's here's how one would go about 
going from what's on this page to an edition, that kind of thing. But yeah, I think that would be so cool. I think that'd be so cool, especially. Yeah, I think that would be great. I think I'm a big proponent of that. Okay, well, I've, I've got to get you to like write a recommendation for me or something. <laughs> Um, a letter of recommendation to the museum being like no but like you don't understand how cool it would be if you could do this yeah um, well yeah that would that might help but <laughs> so, so a lot of the manuscripts you work with are at the british library is that right yeah so a lot of them are at the british library um they are there are a handful that are in the states the smithsonian fairly infamously um popped one in the post and mailed it um which was a move, um, not not overnighted it even, just, just snail mailed it. Um, it did get there eventually. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, so most of them are, as you say, under lock and key. A lot of them are at the British Library. Uh, a lot of the manuscripts that I work with, they kind of have a variety of different provenances. I'm going to Italy later this summer to work with some manuscripts. Um, including I might get to see the Vercelli book of old English poetry, which would be pretty oh, sweet. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be really stoked about that. Um, and then there, and then I'm going up to Utrecht to work on a project there that involves, um, there is an old Irish poem called uh, the feast of Brook Crew, uh, which is like one of those really cool Irish myth stories. Um, and they found a manuscript that has text on it um, that seems to indicate a different ending for the text than we previously have, hmm. but it's a, quite a damaged manuscript. And so nobody's really totally sure what it has on it. So we're gonna try and image that and try and recover that. Um, and then there is a chance of going to Sarajevo to work with a rare Bible there of some capacity. So the manuscripts that I work with are scattered everywhere. And then um, there is, I have been trying to work in the state of Colorado to work on much more contemporary things. So I'm a medievalist by training and by love. And it's the sort of thing that means a lot to me. But one of the things that is true is that personal histories, um, kind of the histories of people that are less grand, less famous, personal documents, um, get damaged, right, mm -hmm. by wear and tear, not necessarily as dramatic. Like I was in Dresden one summer recovering um, manuscripts that had been firebombed or put in the basement of the library to protect them from the firebombing and then the river rushed in. And so like mm -hmm. you get like really dramatic stories, but sometimes uh, one of the things that I recovered relatively recently was um, the Lazarus Project, which is a project I used to be associated with, uh, worked to recover a valentine uh, that had been on somebody's house and then the house burned down. And so they wanted to recover the last valentine their grandfather gave to their grandmother, uh, which was just wonderful. And so a thing that I've taken away from that lesson is this notion that um, personal histories are radically frequently erased because of damage. And I happen to have the technology that can bring it back. And sometimes it's just personal things like that. Sometimes it's an, a way to access underrepresented histories, whether that is people that have been neglected from the historic record because they didn't have enough money or for radically different reasons. And so I'm working on trying to find the best processes of using this technology um, in addition to my scholarly efforts of medieval texts and medieval maps and of just trying to work on um, recovering a personal material that tells a story that might not be in the history books. And I'm, I'm gonna jump ahead of a question yeah. in the chat here because I guess it's just a prerogative of being host. Um, <laughs> when you talk about having this technology, is this something that you're carrying around taking to different places? Or is it stuff that's like at the institution, right? Like, it, it, do you have like a special camera and a briefcase that you're carrying around? What What are we talking about? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the Library of Congress has um, a version of this that is completely stationary. Um, and one or two other universities have like stationary versions. But the Lazarus Project in upstate New York, where I was trained, um, and the University of Hamburg, me, and maybe one or two other institutions has a completely portable system. And I have 
the first of a new generation of systems developed by RIT to be super portable. <laughs> so it's uh, more accessible cost-wise, the technology is slightly more straightforward. And so I have real hope about more people having access to this technology going forward. But traditionally um, it has been pricey. And so, um, but people developed the tech ability to bring it, to make it more portable so you could still bring it to other places. So my PhD advisor, Greg Hayworth, discovered that if you, you, you could fit it in golf bags. So you just have to check it. And if you put one golf tee in it and one golf ball, it counts as sporting equipment. <laughs> Pro tip. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and so you can make it, you can bring it with you. Um, you do have to make sure that the plugs can handle the technology after, you know, again, my sure. PhD advisor, he would claim that he prevented a fire in the Pope's bedroom, but I would argue that he started it in the first place. So I'm not really sure that you get to claim you stopped it. Um, dubious. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Um, but actually, I want to jump back to a much earlier thing that we talked about when you talked about your video um, that was trying to give the experience of working or your potential video of giving people the experience of working with an old Norris manuscript that wouldn't be able to interact with the document otherwise. Um, there is a book that's called Marvelous Manuscripts or something. It is written by... Um, the most old school British dude that has ever existed and that comes through in the writing. But he tries to do this. He tries to bring the reader into these reading rooms that he has access to because I think he used to be a former curator of the British Library or something and, um, and give them access to it. He doesn't have any Old Norse materials on it. So if any of your viewers are interested, it might be a great like introduction to that type of thing before you okay. get to go and work with this manuscript. Um, he does, I think, have some early English materials, but I don't think there's any old Norse stuff in there. So. Oh, that's so cool. So cool. Very cool. And if you get the audible version, uh, I think he reads it and it's just, it compounds the Britishness of it in the most charming and delightful way. Well, if you say he's the most old school British guy ever, that's that's a huge claim. I'll be interested to see what exactly that entails. I have a picture of what that entails. Uh, Lorian asks, uh, if you have a manuscript where two pages have been stuck together and the writing is damaged, can you use the multispectral imaging to recover text even if they might just look like a shadow? Is it possible yeah. to use the magnetic property of iron to recover writing that may not be visible enough to see with the naked eye? What a beautiful question. So your question is actually two parts. Yes, it is possible um, to use multispectral imaging to recover it from even a shadow. Um, iron gall ink is slightly acidic, and so it actually eats into the substrate. So whatever it's written on, whether it's paper, parchment, et cetera. Mm. And so even if the ink itself is no longer visible, there is frequently some trace of either the ink or the hole left by the ink that we can recover. Mm. So. Um, you will occasionally see things like ghost letters that you can work to get back. Um, think about, and then to jump to your other part of your question about the magnetic properties or the, um, of iron gall ink. Um, it's sort of, I don't do this, but Brett Seals out of the University of Kentucky has started using um, CT scanners to work with specifically materials from Pompeii and has created an algorithm to digitally unravel the Pompeii scrolls. Wow. But by doing that, which is pretty sweet, so then you can read it. But the thing that he actually uses is the, uh, the metallic qualities of the iron gall ink in a CT scanner to kind of flatten it out. Um, it is, think about like, if you, if you happen to be a tattooed kind of person, Old school tattoos, they didn't let you get in an MRI machine or a CT scan without having a chat with you about the potential damage of that. Um, I, some, one of my former students was a tattoo artist and he told me that's no longer true. But I guess uh, tattoos used to have a lot more um, metal in them. And uh, it's the similar type of thing. It's the similar type of response that the, um, the CT scanner can can find. And so, yeah, the magnetic properties of the ink can actually be used to read text that you can't otherwise read, as long as you have access to the relevant equipment and possibly bread seals. Hmm. 
I mean, and what you're saying about the acidic nature of the ink, uh, Stella has pointed out uh, maybe Iron Gall is a possibility for medieval Icelandic manuscripts, but I, I, I kind of know what you mean about ghost letters. Like I, I'm trained in paleography, but not in manuscript per se, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I know looking at a lot of, of, of Old Norse manuscripts, which is most of what I'm going to look at, of course. Um, yeah, occasionally, like I can tell there was something there. Even yeah. if the letter's gone. Like, is that also part of how you read palimpsests? Is looking yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes it's wild. Like sometimes the parchment itself is like kind of dirty and there'll be a place that's like a little bit cleaner and you start to realize that the little bit cleaner part parts form a pattern and that there was presumably something protecting that bit. And you're like, oh, I wonder if there was ink that was like washed off or faded or something happened to it. So it's no longer legible. Um, and, or you start to see bits of the parchment that are slightly thinner and you're like, okay, something used to be here again. It was kind of eating into it. Um, but yeah, it is that kind of like, um, that half seen thing where you're like, something looks different about the spot. Mm -hmm. And sometimes multispectral imaging can be quite useful there. The kind of, um, the what I will call the grad school trick. So if you're trying to do this without any kind of budget or technology, um, it would be to try and, if you're in an archive that will let you, uh, which is not every archive, is to hold up a manuscript page and shine your cell phone light underneath it and see if you can get the light to come through stronger where mm -hmm. the parchment is slightly thinner. Um, and if you have a buddy cell phone, you might even be able to take a picture of it to kind of try and try and transcribe that later on huh yeah i can see what you mean um, um sorry no go ahead so i was just going to jump back to stella's question about the uh iron gall ink and icelandic stuff we there are a lot of cultures that don't have uh preserved recipes for iron gall ink um we're not quite sure why if, if it was just like a thing that was taught and so then wasn't necessarily written down but it seems but there are people studying the chemical composition. Um, uh, Ira Rabin out of the University of Hamburg has done a lot of work on the chemical composition of inks in various places and different kinds of manuscripts. And um, even in places where we don't have recorded recipes, there still seems to be some similarities in what is going on with the ink, albeit with local ingredients, if that's a helpful. I see. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gavin asks if you could go into the dark art, I almost read the dank art of dating and locating texts geographically through paleography. Oh, um, hmm, yeah, uh, that feels like the appropriate way of uh, describing that. Um, so <laughs> Gavin also walked into my office one day and I handed him a damaged manuscript and went, I don't know what language this is. Here's my two guesses. Can you figure this out? And then I made him do it. So that's one way to do it is have willing grad students. Um, <laughs> don't actually do that, but you know, it is an effective way. Sorry, Gavin. Um, but the other thing is that, okay, so may, so okay, so here's a way to think about it. If you want to, if you were taught in school for in a certain generation, you learn to write cursive, right? My understanding is that students today don't learn to write cursive and learn to write print. If you are of a slightly older generation, not only did you learn to write cursive, but you learned that cursive was the only real formal way that you were expected to write. If somebody else is gonna see your handwriting, it should be proper penmanship. And so even within, between my grandparents' generation, my parents' generation, and my students' generation right now, we have seen a change in handwriting and a change of expectation of what handwriting should look like. And so you can, even within what, a 50, definitely a hundred year period, you can see that our own handwriting has changed. And so this is true for medieval texts as well. So you can use the change in handwriting to try and locate where a text is from. You can try and use it to locate when a text is from. So like, um, handwritings will have different styles depending on basically who trained them, right? Mm. If, you're, if, your parents, if your parents are from Europe and write the funky European sevens or nines, you might have grown up writing a seven or a nine like that. 
Um, and so you can kind of see how these, uh, these handwriting traits are passed down or deliberately changed. So again, that sort of like the difference between cursive and print that we now see in schools. Um, and there's, you can use these shifts, these differences in handwriting uh, to try and locate manuscripts. Uh, some handwritings are easier. So if you are looking at early English material, especially early English material in Latin, it is so much easier to read then by the time you get to the 13th century and you're like, what punishment did I, yeah. what did I do to deserve this punishment? I have direct um, experience with this shift. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know what Icelandic material looks like, but I can only imagine a similar kind of thing is going on. Well, in the 1200s with stuff like the Codex Regius, you have Carolingian insular, oh. right? Carolingian with like some insular touches. Yeah, and yeah, that's, yeah. yeah easy to like give me that all day that's like reading print but yeah. you, get to, you know like even as it, like even just in the 1300s you start moving in, in that gothic direction it's like damn it right I mean, <laughs> I'd, I'd rather sit here with a dictionary of a language i don't know that's in clear print and try to read that than try to read this language that i do know <laughs> this god-awful handwriting right i mean it's that some of that gothic stuff is as bad as old Roman cursive. It's like, yeah. yeah I, I, I don't know. Like I'm trying to read the gestalt of the entire word because I can't even tell where the letters separate. It's, it's so, uh, there's not a polite word to describe it. Um, no. Yeah, it hurts. Um, but yeah, exactly. And so one way of thinking about this is that you can kind of date a manuscript based on how much it hurts to read. <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah that is fairly you you know you just kind of have to know when the painful centuries are and you can kind of go from there i would say at least in scandinavia probably 1600s 1700s are the absolute worst yeah um i don't know as much about english gavin says 15th century spanish is pretty bad <laughs> gavin's been staring a lot of, at a lot of 15th century spanish so i believe that <laughs> You know, and it, it makes me wonder, it's it's sort of a left field thought or question, but it, it makes me wonder, you know, why, right? Like, is it just, is it, if it's supposed to be decorative, I still feel like Carolin Carolingian Insular, which is very clear, is decorative. Unseal, yeah. which is very clear, is decorative. Like the Book of Kells is not like that's that hard to read, but it's dec extremely decorative. What what What's with this? this trend uh, toward the Renaissance of, you know, God awful handwriting. <laughs> I wish I knew it's like a increasingly way to make it formal and stylized and increasingly makes it. Yeah. Increasingly illegible and increasingly suffering. Um, Stella, I think I saw earlier a comment that you made about um, a lot of the later Icelandic manuscripts are like that too, because they start using cursive. Yeah, um, absolutely. And as, if I remember correctly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that the Icelandic manuscripts, the sagas, are still copied in manuscript form up through the 1800s. Yeah. And so you get them in 1800 style handwriting, which like is not easy. You know, like materials from the 900s are way easier to read than materials from the 1800s. Although the 1800s, at least in Scandinavia, start to like kind of crawl back from the 1600s, 1700s awfulness. Yeah. But so, like, I mean, it's that's not, good. It's not a linear, like, gets worse and worse and worse. It's like it gets worse and worse and worse, then it gets like slightly better again. <laughs> right. Um, I don't understand the stuff. I, I just don't get the point of it. Right. I mean, it's, but although I guess it could be kind of elite signaling, right? Like, I, yeah, we could write clearer and cleaner but look at the time that we can expend in making this yeah. product that's, you, you know what I mean? Like, I guess that could be part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, as Shannon's saying in the chat, like minims, right? So like, if you're thinking about like a Gothic textura, like it's impossible to read because there's just minims everywhere. But it is definitely um, a prestige thing. Like if you can pull off writing in this manner, if you can pull off reading in this manner, then your Latin must be, quite good 
And because you have to kind of, as you were saying earlier, like you kind of have to have a vibe for what the word is likely to be. Otherwise you're just not going to be able to read it. And aesthetic, it was supposed to be aesthetically really pleasing. So here's a hot take uh, just off the top of my head. What, what if it has to do with writing increasingly getting pulled out of the church where there's at least an aspiration to, you know, reaching the people um, and functionality oh. and, and writing more and more being done by secular elites who yeah. want to signal more than the, than the church needs to. I don't know. Hot take. I love that. This isn't getting that's published a- or anything, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a really good take. I mean, especially if you think about like one of the first really, um, one of the first really challenging scripts to read is like the secretary hand, right? Which again, there's not a polite word to describe. And that was, um, as far as I understand, that was a secular kind of script at first that was used in the court rather than in the church. I don't know. I like it. I'll buy it. I'll believe it. Yeah, it's just a random thought. Uh, Lorian yeah. asks, could it go back to cost? If I have a manuscript, it would cost a fortune. So I want it to be as beautiful as possible, even if I couldn't read it personally. Lorian, that's a great, um, that's a great question. So when we're talking about manuscripts, um, there's a thing we talk about a lot called conspicuous consumption. Um, and it's the same idea as if you have like a very nice car that you want to show off, right? Like you don't need that car to get to work. You're showing off that car because you want people to know that you have money and that you want people to know that you can kind of flaunt it in this very specific way. And so when we talk about manuscripts, we talk about um, if you have, if you have, for example, the book of Kells, right? If you have this beautiful giant, I mean, that's probably a bad example, but if you talk about this like giant, beautiful manuscript, where they're not trying to squeeze everything onto one page. And instead they're kind of um, fixing the text with very beautiful clear borders and room between each line so that you can read it. Then they're not in that moment trying to squeeze as much material onto a single page to, to save the sheep. Instead, they're kind of preserving this thing as a piece of art. And as part of that, they're kind of also whether intentionally or not, reveling in the status of having the sheep, the resources at hand to, uh, to create this beautiful book that's not, um, that's not the equivalent of like a student writing in the margins. Like, I don't know, you know, like obviously you work a lot on Old Norse. I'm, not, I'm sure that your Old Norse books when you were first learning it were full of margin, marginalia in the corner as you're trying to like work through translating different things, right? Sure. Uh, this is not that, though some of these do have like translations written about it. So perhaps that's not a great example. But, um, but it's this kind of notion that the, at least the original intended text can take up as much space as it wants. So that it can be this kind of elaborate, beautiful work of art kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I wonder how much of this, I mean, you know, we're talking about the Latin alphabet tradition here, obviously. Yeah. I, I wonder how much of this is sort of universal, right? If, yeah. If, I, I don't know as much about other manuscript traditions, say, in, in, in Islamic or Jewish tradition, for example. And, but I also wonder how much of it kind of applies to changes that we see in runic hands, right? Yeah. Or, uh, because you can definitely see traditions evolve there too, right? This is kind of wandering feel, but just like, for example, um, in Sweden in the very late Viking age and thereafter, you see this tradition develop of, of drawing snakes or dragons on a stone and putting all the, the inscription inside of that. And those tend to be really like presentation worthy, right? You know, the letters yeah. are kind of the same, but earlier in time, you mostly see a much more haphazard thing where like, you know, some of the letters in the stone are much bigger and some of them are much smaller and some of them go left to right and some of them go right to left, right? Like there's kind of a, 
it's it's a little more freewheeling. Um, but I, you also see that in the Greek epigraphic tradition, right? As that yeah. develops over over the centuries BC. So, like, I, I wonder how much of this is kind of universal trends in writing as a signaling device, and how that changes over time, and how much of it is particular to the Latin alphabet tradition. I mean, I would love, yeah, I would kind of love to hear more. Um, you know, at some point in the future, I would love to hear some more thoughts on how the runic tradition develops because thinking about the runic tradition as a kind of monumental script is this kind of really interesting notion about thinking about the interplay between um, manuscripts, which may have been written, which were written based in the Latin alphabet versus like runic inscriptions, which were like uh, designed for monumental things, designed for a display, um, and yeah, it's just kind of an interesting to thing to think about, like the kind of to think of those textual traditions not as isolated, but to think of them as kind of feeding back and forth into them, into each other, which might be really interesting. Well, and of course, we see uh, private runic inscriptions too, and there are probably a lot more of them than yeah. were preserved, because like in in, in Bergen, the Bergen finds give us six hundred, you know, runic laundry lists and like notes and and stuff like that um you know crappy love poems like all the stuff that people just threw away um, right 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 so right it did have casual uses um but often those are pretty legible um but then there there is such a thing as pretty illegible runes although often that's pretty deliberate right like they do these cryptic things where like there's ciphers yeah um, it's not so much that there's huh. ever, there are kind of hands, right? Uh, and of course, the the entire alphabet changes. You go from the 24 letter elder to the much harder to read 16 letter younger food arc. I wonder, is that some kind of a signaling change? Like, yeah. There's, I don't know, you just make me think about the kind of um, meta details of writing traditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I like that. And I like, I like thinking about what that change signifies, right? And like, Again, I'm in London. I was in the British Museum earlier today and looking at the objects that they have with runic inscriptions on them, right? And so thinking about like, what, what does that signify as a writing system in that kind of specific context is really interesting as well. Like, why would you choose to write specifically in runes on things like a Frank's casket, right? right. Which, yeah. Um, or like they had, if I remember this the sign, right? They had um, a sword of some kind of weapon a one-sided sword weaponry is not my strong suit uh, a kind of one-sided blade but on the top of it it had I think it was maybe the elder fruit arc and then they had some kind of decorative pattern and then it had a dude's name written out in runes hmm. um, and it seemed to be from quite an early period I there was not much information provided by it but like what that kind of um, I don't know the kind of choices that went into that kind of linguistic signaling is kind of really interesting when you think about it on a meta level. Yeah, I think sometimes, and this is probably true of both both the later medieval Roman alphabet tradition and that early runic tradition, writing itself is something of a signaling act. It's something of a conspicuous consumption of time, if nothing else. And so it doesn't yeah. always matter as much what's written as the fact that there is something written. So yeah. when you see those elder food arc items, with like one word sometimes it's the name of probably the person who made it um or the person who owned it or it's like a comb this is comb right or or sometimes they're a little bit jokey like um one of the famous ones is a spear this is around Yaz, like tester um right okay like um anyway i just yeah you you, you get me thinking about these meta things and, and and of course today uh again we're wandering a field from it's just a little bit, but it, but it makes me think, you know, today there's a lot of signaling that goes on with the meta details of writing, right? Yeah. You do, you do convey something by the font that you choose for your sign, your logo, or something like that. Um, interestingly, <laughs> I feel like we've really moved a long way away from the kind of Gothic Renaissance tradition of like signaling with unintelligibility. Like that's, yeah. a, that's long gone as far as I can tell. Nobody would put up with something you couldn't read easily. Well, except, I mean, yeah, except for if you think about it in a completely different way, right? Like, if you think about the fact that te text speak, right? Like, especially mm -hmm. for those of us that are old enough to remember T9 texting is like 
very specifically designed for people who are like in a kind of digital in group, right? A digital mm. kind of collective understanding of what different abbreviations stand for, a kind of collective understanding of when vowels can be dropped out of a word to kind mm. of speed up the typing of it. Um, and, you know, obviously that's shifting and changing and is definitely not a constant thing, but is, um, is perhaps a comparable, yeah, Gavin, I agree. Yeah, but like something like LOL, you know, to future generations may be as incomprehensible as minims or as some of the nomina sacra are if you don't have them mm. memorized, you know, as a grad student or whatever the case may be. Um, mm. It's just interesting to think about. Like, and similarly, if, if you write me an email in Comic Sans, um, like I probably will make certain judgments about you as a person um, that are based solely on the script and not the content of the email, you know? I'm going to set all of my emails now to tappers, <laughs> right? I think that's worse than Comic Sans now, uh, <laughs> right? Because it's, so, it, like it's, it's, it's like a failed attempt at pretension, right? Because it's used yes. in so many just like stupid ads and stuff. Like, yeah, Papyrus is going to be money. 18 point Papyrus is going to be my email now. Perfect. Yeah, no, it'll be great. Uh, the, signature, this, actually. the signature will be Comic Sans. But the yes. body of the email will be <laughs> papyrus. Yeah, no, that's good. That's very good. And then again, leave it to the email reader to decipher what what you kind of your point is with the various different scripts going on. Yeah, I love it. That's very good. Yeah, but use it like even for the most sober things. Like, you know, I regret to inform you that uh, <laughs> earlier today, your mother <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> yeah no that's perfect absolutely absolutely but, yeah but the, but but like I, and i and and the reason i'm wandering afield in sort of these modern things is because i think they can sort of shed light on that lost medieval world of what are people thinking when they write in a particular way yeah um because i also actually i think email is an interesting place where uh writing signaling really comes up today like because what is in your signature right so people put quotes or they put you know, titles or jobs or offices or, or some kind of statement. Um, and it is, that is a place where people make very conscious decisions about like, well, do I want this to be in like a nice looking serif font or do I just want this to just kind of match like the Arial type font that's in my email? And, yeah. and, you know, you do see manuscripts and Estella points out runestones where you, you do get a change of writing one way or another. So for example, like I think of old Icelandic manuscripts where titles might be in red. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, so like what is being communicated by that? Or, um, I mean, sometimes it's very obvious, like we're just trying to set a, set aside something like right. this is different from what came before it. But yeah, just kind of looking at, at that world of people producing medieval writing and thinking, yeah, these are people who have very much the same ideas of what they want to signal to other people as, as we do today. They're just doing it. Yeah. Differently. Yeah. And I think, I think electronic communication and its various forms is actually because it is evolving so rapidly and it has a lot of unspoken norms mm -hmm. um, that aren't necessarily taught in like grade school that I think it has, it has a lot of really interesting comparisons comparisons to medieval texts in like a slightly unexpected way, right? Like, so um, so I frequently think about and give the example of with social media, people will write how they actually talk versus in more formal forms of communication where they're like, no, especially, you know, looking, thinking about papers where you get like, no, this is how I sound smart. This is how I like formalize. Whereas like, I have a cousin whose Facebook posts are in the most dialect Scottish English and you have to literally sound them out to try and get what he's saying. Hmm. And it's this kind of, and the because I'm a certain kind of nerd, I frequently think about the comparison of that with like medieval manuscripts where spelling isn't always standardized or depending on the level of Latin education, some of it is phonetically sounded out Latin rather than like correctly spelled Latin. It tends to be similar, but you get some dialect things in there. Um, and, or, um, again, your email signature one is very good, but thinking again, also about like 
text messages and how we communicate more informally. Or um, one of the things that I think is true, I have to kind of tease out the thought at some point and write something more intelligent than this ramble is going to be. But I think that there's a lot of overlap between the structure that we have collectively built into Wikipedia and the organized layout of medieval manuscripts where things link together in ways that may be unexpected, but kind of illuminate different aspects of it. So if you have a medieval manuscript, you will frequently have a big chunk of text and then kind of scribbles on the sides or on top of the text, or you have formalized blocks of text around it. And there's a way to think about these things as being the Wikipedia links, the Wikipedia rabbit holes that you would fall down. And so I think that if we start to think about the ways in which electronic communication in our various many plethora of forms kind of mirrors these medieval textual traditions, uh, there's a lot of overlap. Well, and, and by the way, you've taken about an hour of your time. So whenever you need to go, just tell me. Because I'm, uh, I'm going to- good for a little bit. I'm going to give you another hot take here. Um, it occurs to me that maybe today punctuation has a similar signaling yeah. value as writing itself once had because I see so many examples of people who don't know where punctuation marks formally are supposed to go, who basically feel like a text is kind of like naked or not formal enough without it and just like throw it in at random, right? You know, like quotation marks around things that aren't quotes yeah like, this sentence looks, <laughs> looks long so i'm just going to put a comma in there somewhere right or um you know uh, i have a friend who um you know you were a mystery science leader 2000 i'm familiar with its existence yeah okay he's a writer for this the, like successor show and he he and one of the hosts uh have a podcast where they read terrible books and uh, <laughs> incredible okay perfect it's pretty great 372 pages will never get back but one of the books they read uh was this terrible fantasy novel called antigua and uh legendarily this book is like one period in the entire thing everything is exclamation points <laughs> right but like that strikes me as someone who's it's 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 a sort of and this this is going to sound like a real burn term but i can't think of a better term it's a very semi-literate attitude toward punctuation yeah. right yeah and i wonder yeah, how, yeah. how how much of that has moved from the writing itself because people learn how to spell reasonably well or their you know phones tell them how to spell things yeah although yeah spell check is is changing the spelling of the word lightning because everybody gets it corrected to lightning oh yeah right? like if you watch yeah like the, the graph of how much lightning and thunder is spelled lightning and thunder. It goes way up after spell check. People... Whoa. But so like spelling and stuff is not so much part of that signaling anymore. It's, but I think a lot of that signaling has moved to punctuation. Okay, yeah. That's my, my, my dumb. Hot no, I believe that. And I mean, and the punctuation stuff can be subtle, right? Like I can, I would argue that a lot of people could kind of ballpark the age of somebody sending a text message based on the kind of punctuation that they use in the text. You know, yeah. like your grandma is going to say, love grandma at the end of a text message. Right. But like right. your parents will probably include full punctuation in it. Um, people of roughly my age might not include that much punctuation in it. And then Zoomers, who knows? Um, yeah. But yeah. like... Um, my tour director, so I'm, again, I'm teaching study abroad. We had a tour guide for a bunch of the tour for the students. Um, all of his messages would end in dot, dot, dot. And I felt like, <laughs> I felt like having a talk with him at one point and I never did, but I wanted to be like, bro, you know, that reads passive aggressive, at least to Americans. And I don't think he meant it that way. It was the most fascinating example that comes to mind recently of somebody like just misgaging how other people are reading uh, ex <laughs> punctuation in texts. It was just, it was fascinating. Yeah, I mean, if, if you send me a text that ends with dot, 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 I'm thinking there's something else coming, <laughs> right? Right. Or if you tell, or if you send me a text that says something like, we're meeting at, you know, UCCS campus or something, and then it ends dot, dot, dot. I'm thinking, so what are you implying that I forgot? Right. It's, yeah, right. it does seem kind of passive aggressive. Yeah. That's interesting. If, if, 
Yeah. If he, if you send me a text message that says we're meeting at nine dot dot dot, I'm gonna like immediately panic that it's like nine thirty and I showed right. up half an hour right. later. Yeah. 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 There's like an implication that something is missing, and uh, hmm. but it was like clearly culturally or something it was just not there for that. Okay. Yeah. You're right. There's a lot of interesting stuff to to, <laughs> to put into here. Uh, Gavin asks, "What what is your favorite minim?" And uh, uh, what has been your most juicy mystery in manuscript or map study so far? Oh, that's a good question. So my favorite minimum is literally none of them, Gavin. Um, they hurt. Uh, I'm intrigued if you have a favorite minimum. Do you have a favorite minimum? I don't know what a favorite minimum would be. <laughs> okay. The letter, the letter I? Like. <laughs> yeah. Um. My most juicy mystery. Um, so facetiously, my favorite thing is that I accidentally did something when processing a document recently and the resulting image definitely looked like there was a dinosaur and in the medieval map. And I was like, I don't know what's going on here, but, uh, and I did, I spent like maybe 20 minutes staring at it. And I was like, no, no, this is just definitely an error that happened somewhere. But it was a beautiful 20 minutes of trying to figure out why on earth it appeared that there was a dinosaur in this medieval manuscript. Um, my personal favorite mystery, I think, is just when you find that something has been mysteriously palimpsested and you didn't know it. Or um, a document I was working on recently had been double palimpsested and we had no idea. Um, my, there's a whole bunch of juicy manuscript mysteries. I, the document that I'm working on right now, I sort of strongly suspect has Roman provinces on it when there shouldn't be Roman provinces by about 500 years. Um, and so um, that leads to an interesting kind of transmission of knowledge question that will be a future deep dive for me. But um, for, your, for your listeners or your viewers in particular, um, one of the most notorious uh, ma- uh, manuscript mysteries um, is the oh, what's it called the old Norse map that the Vinland map that was yeah. supposed to show yeah <laughs> that was supposed to show um, America on it in the 1400s uh, pre pre Christopher Columbus and so these days they have proven that it was a fraud but uh, for a long time like for I don't know 20 years there was like endless amounts of scholarly articles where people were like wringing their hands about whether or not this thing was real or this thing was um, 50 years, sorry, whether this thing was a fraud or not. And they have eventually through chemical analysis proved that it was a fraud, but like things like the parchment was legit. And so there, you know, that kind of manuscript mystery I think has, is just fascinating. You know, even when they turn out to be not real, like it's just, it's just fascinating. You don't have a hot take on the Voynich manuscript for us. Okay, so my one Voynich manuscript story is, um, and if you guys don't know what the Voynich manuscript is, uh, look it up. It's too weird to describe in one kind of simple explanation. Um, But the Lazarus Project, the year before I joined them, uh, imaged a few pages of the Voynich manuscript um, to see if multispectral imaging would reveal anything about the document or about the codex. Um, and I don't think it did, but it did, re- it did result in us getting handwritten letters for a little while in 2014, 2015, um, with people sharing their thoughts on the Voynich manuscript. And I have to say, that is the only thing I have ever worked on that has resulted in multiple handwritten letters finding their way to the lab. Yeah, there's a... There's a whole cottage industry of people who think they've got that figured out. Yeah. Um, and if you guys ever get bored one day, and I mean, you have to probably be pretty bored, but if you ever get bored one day, maybe you're stuck in a meeting or whatever, um, then just go through and count how many articles there are published periodically where somebody swears that they've cracked it. Um, I think in just before the pandemic, uh, there was, was it a London re- like London Review of Books or something or LA Review of Books. There was like, there was like two like major publications, The Guardian, I don't know. There was something, some UK based one and then some, um, 
stateside based one that both published articles within a within like six months where somebody had claimed to have solved the Voynich manuscript. It was incredible. One of my favorite tweets that I go back to again and again, uh, somebody wrote something like, uh, the Voynich manuscript can't be read by mere humanity scholars because it was written in, you know, by, by an epic science or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very like good. 2010s meme. Um, yeah, I like that. Gavin also asked if you could get into verso and recto and rebinding and hair versus interior and the terms like this. Yeah. Okay. Gavin, here's your little protocology lecture for the day. Um, so in addition to paleography as a way of dating manuscripts and kind of locating them in space and time and whatever, there's a number of other ways that we can do it, including um, including this kind of notion of hair side and flesh side. So <laughs> that kind of one of the one of the wilder things that is true about um, manuscript studies is that you start really thinking about the fleshiness of the animal um, in a way that feels mildly uncomfortable. But Elaine Traharn wrote this really brilliant art article that's called something like the flesh of the animal or the flesh article or something very straightforward about this. But um, but it talks about the fact that, you know, the pages really were living, breathing creatures. And one of the things that is true with parchment is that you can see on the parchment itself, you can see the hair side and the flesh side. You can see one side um, used to have hair on it and one side was the interior bits holding the guts in the animal, right? And the very, very well prepared, the highest quality parchment the highest quality vellum, you cannot at all see the difference between the hair side and the flesh side. Mm. But, um, or you can kind of see less. But on most manuscripts, you can sense which side is the hair side and which side is the flesh side. And there's interesting things about the pattern of like, if when you were binding a book, if you went hair side, flesh side, hair side, flesh side, or if you'd go hair side and hair side matching and then flesh mm. side and flesh side matching. And so that's another way that you can use to localize the manuscript. That you can kind of guess where and when it's from. Um, and it's also one of the things that if you're talking about frauds or mysteries in manuscripts that can be used to verify or to question the legitimacy of these manuscripts. And we're thinking about binding and we're thinking about patterns of how these things fit together. I see. Hmm. Right, because someone who was making a fake wouldn't necessarily know that in England in the 1200s, it was particularly, you know, hair side to hair side or whatever. I see. Interesting. Right, right. You kind of start getting in the minute details and like um, worms, like bookworms are a real thing, not just the thing your parents called you. Um, and that you can see the kind of patterns of bookworms as they eat their way through the pages. And so again, one of the things that is relevant is specifically to the Vinland map is this kind of pattern of, wor of bookworm eating through that pages huh. and if they line up with the codex it's bound in um i see huh yeah right you're like and literally so, tracing the trail of this worm huh mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because huh. again if you start thinking about the pages as actual flesh right you, yeah um huh. yeah it's weird but functional um i had oh and then the other very weird minute thing about a uh, manuscript about parchment itself that I'm kind of obsessed with is this notion of like if you get high enough resolution images you can actually look at the hair follicle pattern on parchment like the and so you can see which side is the hair side but you can also identify what species it comes from based on the okay, hair follicles sure. which is well, that, I could see how that could help with localization yeah yeah right. and it does yeah yeah huh. Right, like is it this breed of sheep or, you know, that, yeah. can, I mean, can you yeah, get yeah. that detailed? Like, Yeah, 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 and things like um, in Southern Europe, they tended to use more goats than sheep and in mm -hmm. Ireland and England, yeah, I mean, they still have sheep everywhere. That's been true for a while and you get mostly sheep. Makes sense. Huh. Yeah. yeah. And then recto and verso terms that I explain oh. sometimes, recto, these being terms for the front and back of a, of a well, we, we, we use leaf and page differently talking about manuscripts. 
Yeah. So I'll let you. No, no. I mean, yeah, you're exactly correct. Recto and verso is the front and back. And um, if you are, if you're talking about like a book that you have on your bedside stand, right? Like you'll turn the page. But if you're talking about, and like you'll have page, what it, was your podcast called? 371 pages that. <laughs> So like you might change the page from 371 to 372. Um, But if you're talking about manuscripts, then you'd have um, folio uh, 371 and it would have a recto and a verso. Um, Or you'd have, um, and yeah. And so slightly different. And then 371 recto, 371 verso. And then the next leaf that you would pull up would be 372 recto 372 verso etc right does that make sense to me i mean well yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're gonna to you. no, I've, I've, I've i've restated this in a, in a couple different places where i, I uh, like I, I think that going back to the original manuscript is always a really interesting rewarding endeavor um so i try to to explain some of these things here and there in different videos um but clearly you've shown me there's a lot of meta stuff with the manuscript itself that could be very interesting that I just, I hadn't never considered. So thanks yeah. for that. Oh, cheers. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, one of the weird things about working with like um, science -y folks on manuscripts is you kind of get into the weeds on manuscript studies, but it's cool. I like it. Oh, I, I, I appreciate it very much. And, and thank you for your time. Is anyone else want to throw another question or comment in here? We can let you get back to your, your England evening. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and you guys can enjoy your Colorado morning, hopefully quite nice. And oh, people are all over the place. <laughs> Donna, <laughs> super so illuminating. Super illuminating, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that pun a lot. <laughs> well, when are you going to be back in Colorado? Um, actually, I fly home tomorrow. So oh, okay. after this, I've got to go get my COVID test to prove I can come home. And uh, then we'll be good, hopefully. All right. Well, hopefully see you yeah. before too long. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. One side of the state or another. And uh, Yeah, exactly. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks, Gavin, for coming too. Thanks, Stella, as always, for finding all these links. And uh, yeah, Stella, thank you. Stella, feel better. And uh, Helen Davies, thank you so much for your time. And everybody, all the best. Thank you so much for inviting me on here and thank you everybody for listening and for your questions. They're really wonderful. And yeah, Stella, thank you so much for all the links and I really appreciate it. All right. All thank the you. best, everybody. Bye, y'all.